time, over time, um, in the worst off. Keynote speaker for this afternoon, and then we'll go ahead and we'll get started with, with this talk on the event of premium hypertension. Uh, thanks, Nick. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Nick did warn Dr. Feldman that he was going to have to deal with the postprandial tie, but he's the first batter up after lunch. And so, uh, but he's going to keep us all awake uh, with an update on idiopathic intracranial hypertension. For those of you who don't know, we just recently completed uh, one of the uh, best and biggest uh, multi center trials in the treatment of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, uh, the IIHTT, and, and those results are continue to uh, come out, and um, Steve's going to address that. Uh, Dr. Feldman is the chair uh, at, the, at the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Rochester back in New York. He did his um, residency at Albert Einstein, or was that med school? Was residency? Okay, and then fellowship with Bill Hoyt in San Francisco. Now, there's a neurosurgery fellowship on your bio. What's that about? Uh, that was a year of research in neurosurgery. Okay. Visual physiology. You weren't like doing transcranial orbitotomy. Well, we did some transcranial work. Okay. <laughs> uh, Dr. Feld is one of those rare individuals who can combine basic and clinical research, clinical care, surgical care, teaching, administration, and we're really delighted to uh, have him with us. Last night he gave a, a fantastic talk, kind of bringing together the clinical care and basic science uh, research around thyroid disease. And uh, we're so glad you could be with us this afternoon. It's great to be here uh, and to uh, thank uh, everyone for the invitation. Uh, you know, I look at Randy Olson as being one of my mentors, and we have a great relationship. And I must say that this is really bringing coals to Newcastle because your neuro-ophthalmology group are much more expert in hepatic intracranial hypertension uh, than, than I am. Uh, and usually what happens uh, is that, like, the residents beg me to give them lectures on thyroid eye disease, so I never talk to them about thyroid eye disease. So I'm assuming that there's maybe a little room for some uh, getting caught up on idiopathic intracranial hypertension, even though much of the great work has really uh, come out of this institution, and then sort of the mother institution, the University of Iowa, that sort of gave rise to the interest in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Uh, so I hope that, uh, that uh, I'll get corrected for any misstatements I make, and uh, we'll, we'll all learn. Um, so, it turns out that idiopathic intracranial hypertension has had a few other names in its history. Uh, pseudotumor cerebri, really nobody liked that term because it's had the word tumor in it and people forgot about pseudotumor. And then the residents would always get confused between orbital pseudotumor and pseudotumor cerebri and they'd use them sort of interchangeably which would be great except the diseases are completely different. Um, and then benign intracranial hypertension was actually popular until um, really uh, the Iowa group uh, said, hmm, you know, it's not so benign. Patients are going blind, and we really shouldn't uh, sort of color or bias the outcome of these patients who are serious enough by calling it benign. So now we call it IIH, which is a mouthful. Uh, and so someone in the audience can come up with a better name for it. I'm sure there's room to change yet once again. I'm going to start out with a case. This uh, patient uh, is a 27-year-old, 5'3 woman, which in my house is tall, but in most <laughs> places it's short, uh, and uh, overweight. And uh, she had a history of uh, a renal stone, actually. Uh, she was treated with IV antibiotics, including vancomycin, uh, but wasn't really treated with tetracyclines or anything like that. And within nine days, she developed blurred vision. And her vision, uh, as you can uh, see, was really reduced, 2400 in the right eye, 2070 in the left eye. And this is like, uh, you know, the grand poobah of papilledema. And this is about as bad as papilledema gets. So this was not your usual case. A lot of hemorrhage, a lot of disc swelling in both eyes. Uh, and uh, the blind spot, as you might expect, was, uh, was increased and there were central scotomas. 
in, in both eyes. And here you can see on gold bond fields, yes, we still do gold bond fields. Uh, and uh, you can see that there is a bilateral central sequel central scotoma. Um, a bit about the criteria for making a diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So uh, up until very recently, it's the modified dandy criteria that we have used. And uh, so you have to have the right symptoms, uh, headache, nausea, vomiting, transient visual obscurations, or papilledema with no localizing signs, but you're allowed to have diplopia from uh, a non-localizing six nerve paresis. Patient is otherwise in good shape or awake and alert. There's no evidence of thrombosis on CT MRI, and the LP uh, was, uh, was supposed to be uh, hit greater than 250, uh, uh, 25 centimeters of water. Uh, I use 25, 250 millimeters and 25 centimeters interchangeably, so if I slip, it's not 10 times the amount of hypertension. Um, and there's no other explanation for the raising of cranial pressure. So this is uh, the criteria that we traditionally use. And then it got a little bit more complicated, and I won't bring you through all this, but uh, this is a new classification with Kathleen being uh, involved in uh, this with Deb Friedman, who was my fellow and was, in, uh, was at uh, the Palm Institute for a long period of time before moving to uh, Southwestern. And things began to change in terms of what's included. And I'd just like to call attention to the fact that uh, there is such a thing as a pseudotumor cerebri syndrome without papilledema. And this is kind of a new concept. Uh, people had intermittently reported, well, you can have high pressure and no papilledema. Uh, I have always had a little saying, uh, I have a number of sort of uh, maxims that I use for optic nerve disease. And the maxim that corresponds to this is that uh, the optic discs are not the manometer of the central nervous system. And so it, you don't have like a gauge sitting there, a 260 and turns into papilledema, and a 240 goes, you have no papilledema. So different people have different tolerances for different pressures in terms of resolving papilledema. But there are other things that have to be present to make sure this isn't a different kind of headache. Uh, for instance, empty cella, uh, that you can have flattening of the posterior globe, uh, and uh, that you can have uh, a transverse uh, sinus uh, stenosis. So, these are things just to be aware of that uh, still in evolution exactly what we mean by elevated uh, intracranial pressure. Uh, so what are the hypotheses? Well, because we don't know, everything you say is plausible. Uh, so uh, Dr. Sugarman did a bunch of studies uh, where he said, you know, these patients are heavy and they have weight on their inferior vena cava and their superior vena cava, and so they just can't circulate their blood and you get high, high venous pressure, and this is what the underlying pressure, uh, problem is. But really, uh, it doesn't really fit for most people that this is a, uh, a logical uh, extension. Uh, sleep apnea is regularly associated with patients who have IIH, but it's not the other way around. If you go to sleep clinic, you can examine thousands of patients and they don't have IIH, nor do they have AION or all the other things. I think that uh, having sleep apnea just means you're more susceptible to just about everything, including IIH. Um, hormonal influences, again, you know, the great, the vast majority uh, of patients are women, uh, why should that be so? Well, maybe there's some hormonal influences, but no one's really identified what those hormonal influences might be. Um, of course, you can increase CSF production, uh, and uh, in certain uh, papillomas of, uh, that involve the, the core plexus, uh, you can actually get increased CSF production and, and overcome the absorption system. Uh, this is like overproduction glaucoma. This is glaucoma of the brain. I'm sure that you've heard that term before. Uh, decreased CSF absorption is probably what's going on most of the time, but we don't know exactly why. I did see one interesting article just recently, which I haven't had time to read in detail yet, uh, talking about uh, aqua porn four, uh, porn four uh, defects as being associated uh, with IIH. So it would be interesting to follow up uh, to see whether that has any uh, validity. 
And then there uh, there's a lot been said about uh, functional or mechanical obstruction of the venous sinuses. So if you raise somebody's intracranial pressure, you put you the tissue pressure collapses or can collapse segments of uh, the venous system. Uh, on the other hand, if you collapse a segment of the venous system, uh, then you get uh, higher venous pressure, which automatically gives you higher intracranial pressure. So, uh, so these are uh, uh, these are some of the ideas. But the fact of the matter is, that we just don't know. And we were hoping that the study I'm going to talk to you about today was going to give us some more clues. And it has not been as satisfying as one would. So the clinical presentation, as I've already alluded to, is obese young women, usually with a recent weight gain, and headaches that are often constant, horizontal binocular diplopia distance because they have abducting uh, paresis, transient obscurations of vision, uh, which are usually posturally induced, they last seconds at a time, they can be in one eye or both. Some patients do get nausea and vomiting. Uh, in association with it, which really makes it confusing uh, for patients who may be treated for migraine for a period of time because they have nausea, vomiting, and headache, and here's another uh, syndrome with nausea, vomiting, and headache. Uh, pulsatile tinnitus is the noise in the ear. Uh, this is not the high-pitched uh, sort of whine uh, that is uh, common, uh, but rather this is this uh, whooshing sound that is sometimes uh, pulsing. Uh, mild stiff neck uh, because of the increased intracranial pressure, but there are no localizing uh, sim uh, symptoms. Uh, so, of course, we always want to see if we can find the cause. Uh, so, if you eat polar bear liver, uh, then you <laughs> are, in fact, at some risk of developing hypervitaminosis A, which can give you papilledema. I think, uh, you know, at least all the, the third year residents know all about maledixic acid and tetracycline. I've never seen maledixic acid used uh, as an antibiotic in my entire career, but Cipro is an analog of uh, maledixic acid and can cause the syndrome, so that's uh, just a, a, a little prelude. Uh, corticosteroid use, either coming on or coming off, so it's really complicated. It's also used some, by some people in the treatment of IH, so it, it really becomes complicated, and we try not to use corticosteroids. Uh, Closed head trauma, probably from uh, uh, venous uh, stenosis or temporary venous stenosis, and then uh, history of coagulopathies. Again, we think about uh, venous occlusive disease as being perhaps associated with uh, increased intracranial pressure. The signs, um, so the, the vision can be fine and often is fine. As a matter of fact, the IH uh, treatment trial uh, had patients who didn't have much vision and that's one of the strengths and one of the weaknesses of that study, and we'll get to it a little bit. Uh, they can have acquired dyschromatopsia and afterentricular defect, visual field defects of any type. Um, and uh, as I said, they can uh, have uh, abnusis paresis. The papilledema is usually bilateral and symmetric, and I'll show you some evidence for that later. Uh, the neurologic exam, uh, there has been some thought about, you know, with all that elevated venous pressure, the uh, arterial circulation must be affected in some way, and perhaps cortical perfusion is compromised. Uh, but uh, very few patients we see are confused or uh, somnolent or anything like that. Um, so we want to do some tests. Uh, so the first thing we do is to get an imaging test. So we always say, you know, imaging first, then LP. You wouldn't want to image something and find that the pseudo tumor was really not pseudo and that uh, you end up causing complications uh, by doing an LP when you maybe shouldn't. Uh, so we get MRIs and MRVs. Uh, in our institution, we, if the patient is the typical uh, onset, we usually don't get MRVs, we just get MRIs. Some places do both all the time. Anybody who's atypical should have an MRV. Uh, or now I guess they're getting CTVs uh, as well. Uh, lumbar puncture, uh, the, so I used to do them all myself. Uh, and the problem was that you know about four hours a week I was doing LPs, and um, then they found out I didn't have hospital privileges to do LPs because I'm an ophthalmologist, <laughs> and so I had to go back and get privileges and prove that I actually didn't paralyze anybody or anything. <laughs> Uh, in doing the LPs. But now we have um, a PA who does them under fluoroscopy 
And I can tell you that, you know, it's a, just a wonderful thing to have when you know that person's doing them right. Because doing them wrong is a real problem. You can't say anything about how that patient is, what that patient's opening pressure is. If they're sitting up, squeezing, uh, you know, there's a there's a hundred ways to do it wrong. They're all equally easy as doing it right. But if you do it right, you get a pressure you can rely on. And uh, in blood tests, for the in those cases that have venous thrombosis, uh, we like to make sure that there's no uh, underlying cause uh, for venous. So Lars Friesian, uh, who happened to be a fellow with Bill Hoyt when I was a medical student and got to know him uh, extremely well, uh, a very, very uh, detailed and uh, uh, individual who is truly brilliant and has done a lot to help us with our understanding of optic uh, nerve. He was, a, he was sort of the premier disc gazer uh, for, for decades. And he came up with a system of papilledema that uh, allowed us all to talk about the same things. And so this was what was used in the uh, IHTT uh, study. And uh, so just to review briefly, basically uh, stage zero is a normal disc or a not normal disc but with no c halo. That's very confusing and it causes a lot of consternation amongst all of us and I'll show you why when we get to the results of the trial. Um, stage one is this C-shaped halo and it doesn't always project well but basically what it is, it, you see white, a white fuzzy area that doesn't include the macular papilla bundle. So if you see white around the disc then that, uh, but it doesn't include the macular papilla bundle then that is uh, stage one. Uh, stage two is that the halo goes all the way around there's elevation of the nasal, nasal border, and there's no major vessel uh, obscuration. So, zero, one, two, all depend upon what the nerve fiber layer around the disc looks like. Three, four, and five talk about vessels. And so, in three, there has to be at least partial obscuration of one vessel. In four, you have to have <coughs> some obscuration of all vessels, and in five, you have to have complete obscurations of at least one vessel on the disc. And again, you can say this, you know, there's room for interpretation with all these things. But in general, it turned out to be fairly reliable. And you were both, in the study, uh, they were both judged by uh, the principal investigator at the site, as well as uh, by photography, which is where my group came in. And so this is what we did. In addition to uh, looking at the qualitative classification, we actually uh, we're, we, we can stereo uh, the disc, we can blow them up, so the size of beach ball, so every disc is sort of beach ball size, which allows you to see a lot of detail, and uh, we stereo it, we can do a lot of things that help us uh, to actually calculate the area uh, that is involved. And when we do that, we came up with uh, two different areas. And uh, so we came up with what we call the area of white, which is the halo. So if the halo goes all the way around, and we looked at you know the, the vertical and the horizontal, and we would calculate the area of the halo, and then we calculate the area which we call the dark zone. And you can see that on the hill of the papilledema, outside the white zone, it's still elevated off the surface of the retina. And so it, it comes out as a dark shadow, and it also is the inflection point of the vessels. And so you can then get an area of dark. And, that, and we looked at both of these separately as well as together. And so what happens when you try to do a, a treatment trial? Well, here we actually, here's an example uh, from a patient in the IHDT. And uh, here, oops, uh, here's what they look like at baseline. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, pretty much all the way around. And uh, I think there's a vessel obscured. This is so. This there are several vessels obscured. This was called a level four. Okay, so this is a Frisian four. And then one month into the study, uh, you can see that it's still got a halo all the way around, but 
now you can see the vessels that you couldn't see well before, and now it's a two. And then it's, uh, you look back at month eight, and it was still a two, and then two into a one, and then it went to zero at nine months. So this is a really nice case study of how you can follow pavlodema, look at response to treatment, and if you now look at it from the standpoint of the area of white, you can see the area of white goes down, uh, mostly at the beginning, uh, and then it slows down, and similarly the area, the total area, uh, also continues to go down and then flatten. And so, uh, the, in other words, this, this disc size is not very much different than this, or this disc size, but it is different from this one and from the first one. So, uh, we have a nice correlation between the qualitative and the quantitative. Then we took this quantitative assessment and we started looking uh, at it um, against other parameters. And the reason I show you this is, uh, is that, first of all, it's published, so if you're really interested in the data, it's, it's all there. Uh, but the, really, uh, there are a lot of things that really didn't help us very much. Uh, and so you can see that the curves really uh, are not too exciting. There's a lot of scatter. When you're trying to correlate it with visual fields, visual acuity, color vision, all those things, it uh, doesn't always correlate uh, as, as well as you might want it to. Um, so what are the management principles of IH? Uh, so traditionally, uh, we have a few things available to us. Um, we have medical therapy, of which weight loss is the mainstay, and we all recommend that patients uh, lose weight. Of course, it's easier said than done, and in the IHTT, we actually had an obesity specialist group uh, work with each individual enrolled to lose weight, and they, you'll see they actually lost a lot of weight, which was helpful. And then uh, Diamox, or Cidazolamide, has always been the mainstay of treatment for 40, 50 years, uh, but never shown in a class one study, no prospective study, that demonstrated it was useful, but we, everybody tended to use it. Um, a lesser known drug, the one I find very useful for patients who are not tolerant to Diamox, is Neptazine. Neptazine, so if you're doing 25, uh, 250 milligrams of Diamox twice a day, which is a really low dose, you'd be doing 25 milligrams of neptazine twice a day. So it has 10 times the potency, but it also, it seems to have less side effects. And so I use it in patients who seem to be sensitive. Uh, to pyramate, there are no clinical studies, um, but it is um, a mild carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. It's really good because it gets rid of their headache, it helps their headache, and it's also a, 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 a uh, and hunger suppressant, so it really decreases people's appetite, and so they lose weight. So uh, a lot of people, if they don't tolerate uh, Diamox, they'll go to topiramate. Uh, remember that it is topiramate that can cause uh, uh, swelling and uh, closure of the angle, so every once in a while you can compound your difficulties uh, with topiramate. Lasix is interesting. Lasix is sort of the fallback drug. Oh, they can't tolerate Diamox. Oh, they're pregnant. Oh, they're this. And so we put them on Lasix. Uh, there's really no good studies that demonstrate that LASIK is really effective. Patients really don't like it. It makes them pee all the time. And uh, you have to watch their potassium. And it, it's more complicated than, uh, in general uh, than using uh, acetazolamide. So as I mentioned before, we want to avoid steroids if at all possible uh, because of rebound on tapering and because the side effects include weight gain. And we know that, that steroids can either st uh, start uh, with the onset of using uh, corticosteroids, uh, or IH can uh, start <coughs> as, you, uh, as you discontinue it. So it's really hard to manage. Uh, sometimes it's unavoidable. Patients who have severe vision loss, you can sometimes rescue their vision for a period of time with a short course of steroids. So surgery is generally uh, uh, used when medical therapy fails. And the surgical therapies that have come about have been um, usually uh, optic nerve fenestration, and there's a, one eye or both eyes, and the indications tend to be primarily for vision loss, not for the headache. 
LP shunts, which we try not to use anymore because even though they work, about 50 to 60 percent will have some complication uh, soon after they have the LP shunt put in. They get infected, they get disconnected. It, you know, they, your lower back was just never made to hold the shunt. Uh, so ventricular peritoneal shunting, uh, it takes a little bit more skill. Uh, you have to stereotactically uh, place um, the, the catheter. Uh, you can get uh, intracranial hemorrhages, you can get swelling, uh, so it's not completely without problems. It has the same effectiveness in LP shunt, and even though the initial success rate is high, they also have a substantial failure rate, so it's certainly not a panacea, and um, we and the, and the neurosurgeons hate doing them, so it's, you know, it's not like you have to convince them that you want to do an optic nursery fenestration. They're sending them to us to say, won't you please do an optic nursery fenestration? We have to tell them, no, it's not indicated. You really need to do this shot. Um, so optic nursery fenestration, there are really two uh, ways to approach it. Uh, I still use the medial approach that was uh, first uh, uh, standardized in the ischemic optic neuropathy decompression trial. Uh, I think, you know, you're looking at it under as much power as you want in the microscope, uh, and uh, this is uh, very early on, I think John Keltner uh, and, uh, in the 70s published the shunt that occurs between the subarachnoid space and the orbital, interorbital space demonstrating fluid. Uh, but there's also been some demonstrations the scarring takes place and some people feel that the scarring that takes place may protect the nerve from swelling, uh, but also cause further vision loss down the line uh, because the pressure on the nerve back of the disc is still there and you haven't really done anything for the pressure. So uh, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Um, I, don't know if I, can, I don't think it will work, but it was just a 10 seconds showing a gush of CSF uh, with from a super sharp blade. Um, so uh, a long time ago now, uh, I guess almost 10 years ago, uh, I wanted to look at what the effectiveness of surgery for IH was, because nobody had actually done any systematic uh, research in the literature. Um, there's much more data on looking at optic nerve sheath penetration, because ophthalmologists were seeing those patients and got visual fields. But if you're being referred from a neurologist to a neurosurgeon, or to a neuroradiologist, they somehow never stopped in the ophthalmologist's office. And so most of them just had subjective, my vision's better, my vision's not better, or at best they had a visual acuity on them, which is a very good measure. But basically what it demonstrated is that we really don't have too much data on uh, uh, many of the surgical procedures except optic nursery uh, fenestration, which has like an 80% effectiveness. So it, and this is in terms of vision improvement, 80%. So it's a pretty good, pretty good thing to do if the patient's complaining of vision loss. There's not that much to say about it relative to headache because, of course, ophthalmologists never send their patients to a neurologist so they can ask about whether their headache is better. And so we don't really know much about the effect of optic nursery fenestration on headache. So let me go through uh, these are Mike Wall slides. So it's, uh, these are the, uh, the part of the official slide set, or the uh, IHTT, and uh, this has all been published now. And I'm going to show you a few things that haven't been published, but uh, or have been published in subsequent uh, in subsequent to the initial uh, data. So here's the uh, steering committee, and uh, you can uh, see that uh, we have really good representation from uh, Jim Corbett, Deb Friedman, uh, and. Uh, Mark Cooper Smith, Mike Wall, all people who have really a vested interest in uh, IIH over their entire careers. And here was the study. Basically, it was diet plus placebo and then, uh, or diet uh, plus acetazolamide. And the acetazolamide could go up to four grams. So the deal was if, if they could drag themselves in the office and they weren't complaining too much, you increase the dose kept increasing the dose. And normally, I would say the clinical idea was you got to two grams and you pretty much stopped. But now we feel much more comfortable about going actually to four grams in order to get uh, effectiveness. And um, so and then you monitored them. And uh, perimetry was the uh, outcome measure. Uh, optic disc photos were taken. 
uh, at regular intervals, and at six months there was statistical comparison uh, of these two groups. Here are the centers, and you can see that, uh, here are you guys are. I don't think you're that far north. I think you're kind of more like there, right? But no, we're right there. Well, you can see that it's uh, heavily East Coast based. Uh, I guess we have more patients uh, that have the disease or something, but uh, Rochester was one of the centers, and he was another center. So we have a lot of, uh, there was, but there was involvement across the country and actually in Canada. Um, what was, how did, what was the, uh, the BMI in this cohort? And it was hefty. You know, so I think the definition of obesity is a little greater than 25, is that correct? And so these people were obese, obeser, and obesist. <laughs> um, the initial symptoms of IH, uh, headache and vision loss were the first two, headache plus, or headache plus vision loss, pulsatile tinnitus, and then uh, there were a few that were asymptomatic. Uh, look how, uh, what a small, percentage actually had diplopia. So I think it's overemphasized that you should have diplopia. We just don't see that many patients with diplopia. And the frequency of symptoms, again, headache and TBOs are the most frequent. Interestingly, back pain turned up. Uh, we don't know if this is back pain before or after the LP, uh, but uh, certainly one of the complaints. Uh, pulsatile tinnitus, dizziness, which is interesting because one wouldn't expect necessarily them to be uh, busy. Photophobia, uh, perhaps related to headache, and again, neck pain, vision loss. Uh, so you can see the, the relative frequency of uh, many symptoms that occur, some expected and some unexpected in the uh, So John Keltner tells us that this is the most common field defect that's experienced, which looks kind of like an arcuate. Interestingly, the lower field seems to be more susceptible than the upper field uh, in, in many of these patients. How about the severity of papilledema? Well, you know, this is a nice bell-shaped curve. Remember that these patients uh, really didn't have more than a couple of dBs of depression on their visual field. And so we are seeing only the mild IIH cases. And it, uh, it's interesting that it's sort of a, a bell-shaped curve around grade two to grade three, and almost no grade five. And of course, you, there are virtually no grade zeros in, in the uh, study eye. There, some, there were some in the non-study eye. One of the things that uh, wasn't uh, published is what was the symmetry between the eyes. And so this is a calculation that I performed in my lab uh, looking at symmetry. And uh, because unilateral papilledema is always in the differential diagnosis, so it could, you know, is this ischemic optic neuropathy or papillopathy of some sort, or is it optic neuritis, or is this IIH? And so it turns out uh, that virtually almost all but 5% had within one grade to either direction of the study eye. And that's really helpful to us, I think, because uh, you know, the more advanced uh, IIH patients, they almost always have bilateral disease, but even in the milder disease, bilateral, bilaterality is, is certainly the rule. And uh, again, you know, we looked at the relationship of papilledema to visual loss, we really like to say, well, the less edema you have, the better your pressure and the better your vision. It didn't work out that way at all. It seems to be completely uh, random. And similarly, we said, well, you know, if the manometer of the central nervous system really is uh, the optic disc, then there should be a really good relationship uh, with uh, the, the uh, CSF uh, pressure and would mean deviation, and that didn't work out either. Uh, however, what did work out is that we found to the 0.05 level, exactly, uh, that there was a benefit to using acetazolamide and in doing it by increasing the doses in the way that I just uh, described. And most of the effect took place in the first three months. 
And so after that, you can see that these lines are almost parallel between the placebo group and the acetazolamide group. But what you see is that as soon that, that you've got an improvement immediately in the acetazolamide group within a month, and then but not in the placebo group. And that accounts for most of the difference. Uh, what about symptoms? Well, you can see here uh, that uh, the cetazolamide plus diet uh, seemed to improve TBOs, uh, pulse valve tinnitus, dizziness, photophobia, neck pain, and visual loss very, very nicely. Uh, the diet uh, seemed to improve some cognitive, uh, the diet alone with, uh, with placebo seemed to improve some uh, more vague symptoms like cognitive dysfunction, diplopia, uh, and uh, radicular pain. So that's not too unexpected. Um, percent improvement, uh, difference over six months. You can see that with the acetazolamide uh, that you got uh, tremendous improvement in the transient visual obscuration, some improvement in headache severity, and some improvement of the frequency of headaches. Um, so what was the average dose of medication? Well, it turns out that, the, uh, that if you uh, you needed a lot more placebo <laughs> to get an effect, if there was one. Uh, but, so that's not too surprising. What was surprising, I think, to most of us is that people tolerated 2.5 on average, and many people uh, were uh, actually on 4 grams a day. Um, and the effect of uh, acetazolamide on freesian grade uh, was uh, uh, fairly significant, uh, the effect of uh, uh, placebo, of course, in the, in the other direction. So how many treatment failures were there? There were seven treatment failures in this whole study, uh, which basically says you can leave most of these patients alone, they'll do fine. On the other hand, since we wanted to find out if acetazolamide uh, would, would actually help, uh, it turns out uh, that there is a significant difference between the uh, treatment and the placebo. Um, oh, by the way, I guess I, I should point out that all the patients who failed had high degrees of uh, on freezing scale than they present. Um, this is, just shows you the uh, change in papilledema grade uh, in the worst eye over time, and you can see that uh, even the placebos uh, did pretty well. They gradually got better, but they never got kind of got down to where the acetazolamide is, and this is just to remind you again the progression from grade zero to grade five. Um, what is interesting is to look at baseline in six months. Uh, so here's the baseline up here, and you can see this sort of, as I already showed you, kind of a, a distribution, normal distribution in both the uh, baseline of both the study group and you see the zolomite group. But then when you look at six months, you can see that the lower numbers, 0 and 1, are predominant in the pseudozolomide group, but you're still somewhat normally distributed uh, in the placebo group. This is, again, something that isn't in the study. It's just a little study I did, which says, well, what's the, what do the, all those disc hemorrhages mean? And what you find out is that the patients who failed have a lot more disc hemorrhages. But on the other hand, there were also higher grades of papilledema. And so when you have higher grades of papilledema, you're probably more likely to have disc hemorrhages. I'm not quite sure what it means, but I now know that disc hemorrhage is not a good thing to see in a patient with a high age. Uh, one of the sub-studies was to look at OCT and to look at OCT volumes of the, of the nerve. Very interesting study. So here you see uh, papilledema grades. Uh, from uh, zero uh, to grade four. They didn't have any grade fives in the subgroup, or uh, they couldn't measure them. And uh, here you see the OCT, and you can see that it's a pretty good correlation that as you go up in papilledema grade, you get more and more volume, and this is the three-dimensional reconstruction of those curves. So it, it's, uh, it's very pretty, uh, and it may allow us to be more quantitative uh, moving forward. And here you can see over time, uh, this is volume uh, over, uh, over time in the placebo and the acetazolamide groups. And you can again see that you can 
use volume as a disk volume as a measurement to demonstrate the differences between the acetazole and wine and the placebo group. Um, there's also a very interesting uh, phenomena where, uh, so this is uh, getting back to uh, umbilical science. Uh, so we have the RPE that comes in <coughs> in papilledema, the innies. <laughs> And then uh, as it gets uh, better and you treat them, uh, then it deflects posteriorly and they become albies. So, uh, so this may be a sign to tell you whether papilledema is, is uh, progressing or regressing. Um, we did look at disc area versus disc volume. And it is an amazingly good correlation, uh, which I guess one would expect. But what it really means is the z-axis doesn't add much in terms of understanding. If you can quantitate with the differences, OCT is much easier to quantitate than taking measurements using big screens. But uh, the correlation is just amazing uh, between total area and OCT volume and baseline study odd, baseline non-study odd, and in six months study odd, non-study odd. So very tight correlations, and that's, uh, I guess, reassuring. But stay tuned, because we didn't address a whole bunch of problems, especially we didn't address patients with that really worry us with more severe symptoms and signs of I and age, and we didn't look at any of the surgical arms. So we've started uh, two other studies, the, the LIGHT study, which I think has come to a conclusion now, and the LIGHT study was just to continue those same patients in group one to see what happened to them long term. Basically, what happened to them is they got bored and didn't show up for their follow-up appointments. Um, and in the surgical side, uh, the, we now have the site. And the site is, uh, we'll find out probably within a few weeks, uh, whenever study section, uh, whenever council meets in October, we'll find out whether they're going to fund this uh, project which is a natural extension. And the site uh, study is looking again at parametric mean deviation, but uh, these are patients who have uh, from minus eight to minus 30 dB loss uh, on the visual field instead of like zero to six. And uh, they're going to be randomized into a acetazolamide, which is medical treatment, optic nurse fenestration, or CSF shunting technique. And uh, so we're gonna try to figure out uh, by uh, what maximum medical therapy does versus, uh, and, and this is the same thing that we just talked about, versus doing surgery. They're going to be monitored with visual fields, and now OCT is the other outcome measure. And uh, then we're going to look at the results and see uh, what, how, they, how they fare. Um, so we really need to get back to that patient I showed you. So what did we do with this patient? I've given you all this data and talked all about this disease, but here you have this patient in front of you, uh, in front of you has, has 20 terrible vision in both eyes and is uh, really, uh, you know, probably the, the clock is really ticking. So what did we do? Uh, the patient had already been taking 1.5 uh, grams per day of Diamox at the time she was referred, so I really didn't think we had a whole lot of time to figure out whether or not maybe going to two grams or two and a half grams is going to be effective. So she went and had a right optic parachute fenestration. And I mean, this is great. 2040 vision, remember that was just uh, really bad, 2400 vision preoperatively. She comes back from first postoperative visit, 2040. And left eye, which we didn't touch, hand motion. So does anybody have an idea what happened? Operated on the wrong eye. <laughs> So, so what happened to this patient? Here's the visual field. So in the right eye, there's just this big blind spot. Uh, but overall pretty good. And this is the left eye. I mean, just disastrous. Probably going to skip it, right? Well. Does she have an ATP now? I, you know, so the, 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 that was one of my thoughts. My other thought was it was the resident's fault. The resident then said it was the medical student's fault. <laughs> is there an APD? The there yeah, APD? there is an APD. Okay. Three. But uh, it's uh, sort of, but not, not the one you think about. So here's what happened. This patient had a vitreous hemorrhage. 
probably because of hyperventilation during the time of surgery. And it's one of the very few patients I've seen with IIH develop a breakthrough of hemorrhage into the vitreous. And uh, when I last saw the patient, uh, after one of my retina colleagues uh, cleaned all this up, uh, visual acuity is 20-30 in the right eye, 2100 in the left eye. It wasn't completely resolved. There was no APD at that time, and the color plates were back to normal. So just to show you, when you think you've seen everything, then you get to see one more. So thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs>
care of part of the circle, the vicious cycle, so it's going to help it get better. But if they truly have stenosis, it's not going to get better really until you do that or until you have a permanent shunt solution. So, uh, so I didn't emphasize it in, in this talk, and it's not part of the site. Uh, so there was not a lot of enthusiasm for putting this into the other study. What's your experience here? We don't do it very often, rarely. Yeah. Yeah, there are certain centers, uh, Australia likes to do them. I guess, you know, if you're south of the equator, it's, it, there's a different fluid dynamic. Than <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks again. Uh, there are certain centers. Uh, there are certain.